Hello and welcome to Iron Africa on France 24. I'm Fraser Jackson. Here are the stories making headlines across the continent this evening. Families of over 20 migrants drowned at sea call upon Tunisian authorities to do more to recover their bodies. We'll have a report from our team on the ground. On International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, the UN's Weather and Climate Agency are sounding the alarm over disaster readiness. The body says half of the countries on the planet are not prepared should catastrophe strike. We'll speak to one of the report's contributors. And after years of Islamic insurgency, relative calm has returned to northern Mozambique as Rwandan forces secure the area. But their presence hasn't completely brought an end to isolated attacks. Three weeks ago, a boat holding over 20 migrants disappeared near the Tunisian coastal city of Zazis. Just over 10 bodies have been recovered so far, but their families are demanding that authorities do more to reach those that remain in the shipwreck. Fadil Alariza reports. Roads are blocked by angry locals. In the city of Zarzis in southern Tunisia, frustration is growing among families of those who tried to cross to Europe by boat but disappeared at sea almost 20 days ago. Karim lost his wife and their one-year-old baby. They still haven't found their bodies. I can't bear it anymore. They don't give me any information, or they say something different each time. I go to see the Coast Guard and I get nothing. If I had a solution, do you really think would be burning tires? Earlier in the morning, families desperate for information spoke with the governor and authorities. They're furious at their negligence and their delays in searching for the disappeared, something authorities deny. Our work hasn't stopped, especially since families alerted us. Then we offered them a mechanism to try and identify corpses by collecting DNA to avoid confusion. Bodies that have been in seawater for too long are difficult to identify. Some families discovered that bodies were buried without any DNA tests. This mother of a 15-year-old that was on the boat fears the worst. God has taken my son. It's his will. I accept that. But if ever he was buried without me there, it would be truly unfair. Many locals have joined together to help. Fishermen all stopped working to search for bodies. On Tuesday, they couldn't find any, unlike previous days, as they show us in videos they took. We're always looking. It's a desperate situation. We need to find a solution to stop this from happening. The situation is still tense in Zarzis. Some families have to dig up bodies which were buried without being identified. A forensic investigation is ongoing. Today is the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the UN's Weather and Climate Agency is using the occasion to sound the alarm on disaster readiness across the globe. Half of the world, it claims, are not prepared for disaster, and a significant chunk of those countries are on the African continent. Well, joining me now to talk about this is John Harding, the head of the Climate Risk and Early Warning Systems team at the World Meteorological Organization. John, thank you for joining us there live from Geneva. The WMO released a report on the subject today. What were its findings? Well, one of the main findings of, of the report is, is that uh, the number of, no, the risk of losing your life uh, due to extreme events in most countries is actually trending down. And it's because countries have the capacity to monitor, to predict, and to issue warnings for these events. However, for a number of countries, in particular the countries in Africa, that trend continues to be to growing. So the risk of losing your life in African countries due to extreme events is actually going up. And it's because they have less capacity, they have a capacity gap when it comes to predicting and, and issuing early warning systems. Talk to me a bit about these early warning systems that your organization says could help prevent that loss of life. I think people are aware of systems that predict tsunamis and hurricanes, but what else would you like to see implemented? Well, so what's, what's I'm actually, so in, in a few weeks' time, you no know, countries are going to gather um, in, in Sharm el Sheikh in Africa or at, at the Climate Change Conference of the Parties. That happens every year. This is going to be the, 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 the COP, as they call him, for Africa. That's what they're calling it, and the COP for Action. And earlier this year, the Secretary General of the UN, he, he called for basically all people to be covered by early warning systems within five years and asked WMO to be leading those efforts. So you know, we, we would really like to see uh, the discussions at, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh focus on early warnings and, and scale up the efforts to, to build these systems uh, in Africa. 
uh, is important, important to understand you know, in the context of Africa, the, the capacity of African countries to, 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 to monitor and predict some of these extreme events is, is actually increasing they, they, you know, for some of the hazards. If, if you look at the accuracy of a, of a warning for a tropical cyclone, for example, in the Indian Ocean, which have affected Mozambique and Madagascar, you know, the, the accuracy of the three-day forecast today is as accurate as the two-day forecast 10 years ago, which means that those countries have, have now have like tw an extra 24 hours to get prepared to evacuate population. However, these, these, these same countries you know, are very challenged to, you know, to be able to receive these, these predictions and forecasts, to process them, to communicate and issue warnings that the population um, understand. So that's very much where the focus of our, of our attention is going to be in the, in, the, in the coming years. Your report that you just released said that disasters are happening fivefold higher than they used to in the past. What's driving that? Well, that is, that is climate change. Right? The cl climate change is, you know, the, the, the science, the, the, the intergovernmental panel on climate change is, 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 is very clear in its findings. You know, the climate change is going to increase the frequency and the intensity of extreme events. But what it means for, for countries in Africa. So it, it, you know, these, these systems that we're putting in place, these early warning systems, we have to put them in place for, for the, let's say, what, what we can call the recurrent hazards. So it's the floods, the droughts, and, and you can see currently the, the flooding situation in Sudan or the recent fl flooding in Niger. But it also means that we're also going to have to address some, some, some emerging hazards. So th these are hazards which, which, which the country may not have been uh, accustomed to, to dealing with and, and that the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services may not have the systems in place. Uh, to, to, to issue warnings for. We're talking here about heat waves, for example, uh, for some areas that may not have uh, been affected by them. Forest fires or sand and dust storms are also, we see, we've seen a real increase in sand and dust storms in certain countries, which, which may not have been affected by these countries in the past. And that is one of the additional challenges that we're facing in, 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 in strengthening the capacity of these countries and their resilience to these events. Well, we know that the continent is facing a lot of challenges. One of the main ones at the moment is food insecurity, obviously not held by the war in Ukraine. Is there a, is there a risk that these warnings that the WMO is, is giving could fall on deaf ears because of such more immediate threats? No, on, on, on the contrary, I think the, 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 early, the early warning systems you know, are, are very important to, to, to help build the, the capacity of the countries to, to deal with, with such, uh, such threats. I mean, one of the drivers of food insecurity is, 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 the, is the, drought, the drought situation. And having, having an increased capacity to, to predict these um, really helps in that regard. You know, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing countries like, like Burkina Faso, they're, they're, ab they're able now to to issue you no know, longer term what we call seasonal predictions so that they can predict you know, a change in rainfall patterns weeks and even months in advance and that information if it's communicated in the appropriate channels to the local population you know, allows them to take decisions on you know, when uh, to 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 plant or, or when to harvest or, or, or what type of a, of a, of a, of, a, of plants to harvest and and that that then that is that these, these become very important tools for those countries to, to be able to address some of these, these, uh, these threats, you know, the, 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 the climate threats within the country or, or external threats linked to food security. John Harding from the World Meteorological Organization, thank you so much for joining us here on France 24. Thank you for your opportunity. 30 African countries, more than half of the 54 on the continent, backed a UN resolution this week condemning Russia's attempted illegal annexation of four partially occupied regions in Ukraine. This marked a slight uptick in support for Ukraine within Africa following a similar vote back in March. Earlier this month, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba toured Africa to counter Russia's diplomatic dominance there and to persuade leaders to support Kyiv. As Sam Bradpiece reports from Dakar, his efforts might have paid off. This latest UN vote does mark a diplomatic shift, albeit a marginal one. 30 African countries voted to condemn Russia's annexation of these Ukrainian territories. And in a similar vote back in March, just 28 African countries voted to condemn the invasion more widely. Among the countries to vote to condemn this time around was Senegal, whose president, Macky Sall, is also the head of the African Union and who received a visit from Ukraine's foreign minister earlier this month. 
Last time around, it's worth remembering that Senegal did abstain. So that is perhaps a success for Ukraine's foreign policy mission there. It's worth stating, though, that Africa is still largely divided on the question of Ukraine. 19 countries abstained in this vote, a position that some think is implicitly pro-Russian. Um, but African leaders themselves, or many African leaders themselves, I should say, view abstention in this context as a way to ensure a position of non-alignment, a way of ensuring flexibility in the face of what is an uncertain future for this conflict. Sam Brapi's for us in Senegal. An explosion on a bus has killed at least nine people in central Mali. The bus was travelling in the Mopti area in the early afternoon when the attack happened. The country has been struggling with a long jihadist insurgency which has killed thousands of people and uprooted hundreds of thousands. The area is also littered with mines and IEDs, with over 70 people having been killed this year alone, according to the UN mission in the country. Well, another place that's been grappling with jihadist violence is northern Mozambique. An al-Shabaab Islamic insurgency has raged on and off in the Cabo Delgado region since 2017, with jihadists seizing control of several towns in recent years. Thousands of civilians have been killed, with almost one, people, one million people displaced by the conflict there. But a coalition military pushback orchestrated by the Southern African Development Community has seen Rwandan forces secure the area. Lauren Burstecker reports. Wandering the dusty streets of Kionga, under the watchful gaze of heavily armed Rwandan soldiers. A year after its liberation, life is slowly returning to normal in this northern Mozambican village, which still bears the scars of the jihadist insurgency. I would say things are, are better now, because people can move, we can do everything, we can go to school, we can buy whatever we want, so things, things are okay now. Over the past five years, the Cabo Delgado province in northern Mozambique has been the target of violent attacks by armed groups affiliated to the Islamic State. For months, Kionga village was controlled by jihadists who used it as a base of operations until the intervention of the Rwandan army in August 2021. Displaced residents are now slowly beginning to return, but the security situation remains volatile and the withdrawal of Rwandan troops still doesn't appear to be on the cards. The next phase will be to try and see if the security sector can be reformed to such a point that they will be able, they will be poised to uh, deal with security uh, after the departure of uh, the Rwanda security force. I don't think I can put a timeline to any of these activities because it's a process. Chased away from major cities, jihadist insurgents have not been defeated. Many retreated to the countryside and continued to launch regular attacks against civilian populations in Cabo Delgado. Well, that's it for this edition. Stay tuned to France 24. France 24, more than ever before, is your window onto the world. Liberté, égalité, actualité.